Several of my epic failures were in college. The first changed my career path. The second changed my heart. My professor walks into my practice room at the end of my sophomore year at the University of Illinois to inform me I was being dismissed from the program. No warning, no buildup, just a monotone announcement that I would not be taking my audition, known as a jury. I will not be moving forward as a classical music major. I can still hear the click of the door as my professor walked out, slamming the door on my dreams, changing my life forever in one of life's defining moments. The unthinkable happened. There was no warning. There was no plan B. Just as in the song, the music died for me that day. I wouldn't play for more than 30 years. My goal is to take you on a journey of where that failure lived in my body and in my brain. Words like cognitive dissonance, cognitive avoidance, neurobiology, these are scientific terms to explain what happens in the brain when we fail. Yet this F word doesn't show up specifically by name in the scientific literature. We euphemistically call it something else, perhaps because it's too painful to say, let alone think about to face the truth. Let's take a deeper look. In the frontmost portion of the brain, the anterior cingulate cortex, science implicates this in several complex cognitive functions, such as impulse control, emotion, and decision making. No one's talking about this F word, and no one teaches failure in academia or business. We need to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly parts of failure and its impact, particularly long term. We need to understand how we learn and what happens within the brain's neurobiology with respect to skill, knowledge, and emotional mastery. We need to learn why this F word can have such damaging effects on the human psyche and in the human body. Some bounce back quickly from failure, and others like me let failure stop them, taking more than 30 years to process suffering the medical and the emotional consequences of its energy. We need to talk about and teach what happens in the brain to mediate these effects of failure, the cognitive neuroscience of self-regulation. Consider how we self-manage, particularly our emotions. Question from a physiology standpoint is the regulation of our autonomic sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, particularly regarding long term failure. What happens when we don't want to face the realities of failure because it's simply too painful? We already know about the immediacy of the fight or flight response and how chemicals dump into the body in our initial reaction. This is not news. These chemicals protect us and give us the strength in the moment to address the fear of being in danger. The interesting story is what happens when the danger has passed, or if there's no danger at all, yet the chemical surge continues. We need to learn what happens in the brain that impacts the body, the heart, the mind, and the soul long term when we fail. In physics and in chemistry, we must follow the law of conservation of energy. Energy can neither be created nor destroyed. But when we fail, this energy releases, finds pathways through our body. Pains perceived in the limbic system, where a surge of chemicals cascades from the trigeminal nervous system, feeding into the hypothalamus, releasing CRF, which releases ACTH, and thus releasing cortisol, our very own aptly named stress hormone. <laughs> when there's disruption in the system and there are high levels of continued stress, powerful neurotransmitters come to the party and overstay their welcome. The system in our brain fails when there are continued levels of high continued chronic stress. Pain is essentially an emotional response intimately tied to the amygdala. According to Dr. Shapiro, negative input associated with bad memories and pain can supercharge the HPA response leading to central nervous changes. Now we know where the science of failure lives. Let's look at how we get that control back. Anyone who's had surgery of any kind will often sign a document that says they should not make any major life decisions for the first 24 to 48 hours post-surgery. Chemicals alter our ability to think clearly. We become reactive, emotional, and we lack appropriate impulse control because we're not in the control of our rational thinking part of our brains. <laughs> Yet we do it anyway. When something we expect didn't happen to us, we enter into a heightened state of awareness. The body doesn't react, recognize the event necessarily or good or bad. It's simply energy. From science, energy must go somewhere. Let's follow its path. During my epic failure, the energy created during that moment when I was dismissed from my college dream changed my path forward as well as my neurobiology, according to the experts. I reacted like a petulant teenager. At first, I was in shock. I replayed the surreal scene with a, what the heck just happened here? 
type of reaction over and over and over and over, you know the loop. I second-guessed myself. I wanted to find that key moment where things went horribly wrong. Maybe with help, I might have changed the outcome. Perhaps I might have even prevented the entire cascade of chemicals from ever happening in the first place. Instead, I just sat there, silent, dumbfounded. <laughs> then I got mad. I wondered what everyone would say. I was embarrassed. I was humiliated. No one was ever dismissed from the program. My friends were moving forward. <laughs> I wasn't. I sat there, too stunned to move, the chemicals swirling in my brain as my emotions took over. Then I got angry. I just sat there and stewed. <laughs> I finally cried. And then I made a decision that would change my life forever. I walked away. I picked up the toys from my sandbox. I heard that fateful click as I closed the door to that practice room behind me in Smith Music Hall, never to return. Put those emotions in a box, and I put that box back away in the back of my closet, and I never looked back. I did exactly what that piece of paper you signed before surgery tells you not to do. <laughs> do not make life-changing decisions while under the influence of chemicals in your brain. No, I'd not been drinking, but I might as well have been, as the I was just as impaired as those decision-making decisions right in that moment. I wasn't thinking clearly, and in that moment, I made a life-changing decision that impacted me for more than 30 years. <laughs> I called my parents. I think they were relieved and secretly thrilled, as my dad in particular never wanted me to be a music major. I called my college roommate. She joined me in my anger and confusion, and then I called my academic counselor, and we changed my major from classical organ performance in the School of Music to the College of LAS with a focus in music history and communication. I still graduated on time with a stint in summer school, but this was my first experience with forced compliance. To stay on track, I had to move forward in a different direction that was not my choice, and it changed the course of my life. Let's be honest, it was my choice, all of it. I simply couldn't face the music, pun intended. I couldn't face the pain that I wasn't good enough. I heard I was the failure, and I couldn't handle the truth. Remember, energy is neither created nor destroyed. It was simply transferred to another form that day in the form of negative energy in my body, placed in a box in the back of my closet and allowed to fester for more than 30 years. Here's where the story takes an interesting twist. The question of what happens to where that energy goes gets answered. The energy got stuck in my body. Over time, I became sicker and sicker. I didn't know why. The doctors didn't know why. I'm considered a Mayo Clinic misfit, having spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in diagnostics with few answers. The more I turned away from my life purpose, the more I turned away from my lifelong dreams and lost the love of my life, the more my subconscious and body have rebelled. Think of the baby, baby who cries to get attention. I ignored the cries. I ignored the warnings. I couldn't interpret what the body was telling me. I didn't listen. Eventually, I understood I was looking in the wrong place for answers. Medicine was looking in the wrong places. Medicine was looking in the present moment at current testing. They don't have diagnostics to go back to that moment in time when my dreams died, when I lost the love of my life. That negative energy of all those chemicals being released initially sat in my body for years. The chemicals from that original surge kept my body stressed because they didn't go anywhere. I was in this constant state of fight or flight with adrenal overload. I remember waking in the middle of the night, feeling as if I'd just run the mile. I don't run. I was exhausted, I was frustrated, I was mad, I was always feeling as if I was out of sorts, as if I were living the wrong life. This wasn't how my life was supposed to be. I got it all wrong. I've been divorced twice. I moved 38 times, seemingly in a perpetual state of always searching for answers, always unsettled, always in motion. I was looking in the wrong places. I was asking the wrong questions. My body always knew what was wrong. I wasn't honoring my purpose. I wasn't living the life I was supposed to. I got it all wrong. According to Gregory Burns, neuroscientists, our brains look for what is comfortable. Unknown and uncomfortable situations typically result in a physical reaction, such as elevated heart rate, rapid breathing, all in the fight or flight response. These physical symptoms teach us to avoid these situations, so we avoid the symptoms. 
Burton suggests that the real challenge requires higher levels of perception, a different fear response, and emotional intelligence. <laughs> no one trains us in these higher levels of perception or this different fear response. I didn't know. After 25 years, when I moved home, the universe began sending messages. My life was about to come full circle. It was time. The irony was that the messenger the universe sent was music. Many of us struggle in finding solutions to life's many problems. We look externally for answers. We ask others the questions we really should be asking ourselves. The universe often sends us these messages and messengers along our journey, yet many of us either cannot hear them or see them, or we ignore them altogether. The answer becomes fascinating, particularly when we invite Dorothy, yes, the one and the same from The Wizard of Oz, to join us on our journey in search of where failure lives in the brain. What may surprise you is that the often the answers to life's questions regarding purpose, peace, harmony, and happiness, and love all lie within the Dorothy perspective. We already possess the ruby slippers. What we lack is the understanding of how to use them. To predict our future, we simply need to write a new ending. To write a new ending, we need to remain confident that we have the answers we seek, and to listen to what the body is telling us to understand where failure lives in the brain. I keep my ruby slippers on my desk to remind me that I've always known the answers. I just had to ask myself the right questions. I had to listen to my heart and be quiet, to listen slowly to the answers, to really hear them. We need to trust ourselves, knowing that we know, knowing that we've always known. Courage is in taking that first step. Courage is in knowing there's no place like home because home is in our heart. We've always had the power to transform. Neurobiology confirms the science behind our emotion. We've always had the power to emerge from the shadows to reclaim our purpose. Failure has no alibi. No one can do this for us. We simply have to trust the person we are inside to lead ourselves to where we've always wanted to go. In November 2019, a family interviewed me to find a home for their beloved 30-year-old baby grand piano. She came home with me and my world changed. The love of music came back. <laughs> Initially, I had to sit and simply be. I didn't play. I listened. I was still. It was in these moments I learned to forgive myself for not seeing that wonderful gift of failure my professor gave me so many decades ago. I opened the piano and I began to play. I could feel the emotions in my hands and throughout my body as the chains in my heart began to soften. The tears began to fall. The body began to shake. My body slowly released that negative energy held painfully for decades. Being a musician is not what you do. It's who you are to your very core. As my heart began to heal, so did my body. I experienced the chains slowly releasing one by one until they no longer chained me to a failure that happened so long ago. I finally found that courage to open that box in the back of my closet for the music I vowed I would never play again. To move faster, we need to slow down. To move forward, we need to move inward. Answers are found in the quiet moments when we listen to our heart. To let go means to be still to listen to what our body already knows. Letting go means forgiveness of self. There are no shortcuts. When we are ready, the universe will send us the messenger for us to begin. Believe in yourself. Know that your heart knows. There's no place like home because we've never left. We have been home the whole time. Namaste.